Good evening. Uh, my name is Mohsen Malani, and I'm the executive director of Center for Strategic and Diplomatic Studies, uh, the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of South Florida. On behalf of our center, I welcome all of you to this very timely and important conversation about uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, before I uh, introduce our distinguished guest, let me take care of some uh, uh, logistical aspects of this program. First and foremost, I would like to express my gratitude to Dean Eisenberg uh, for his support of our center. I also would like to express my gratitude to the distinguished members of our advisory board, uh, the Honorable uh, Judge Raymond Gross, Mr. Ted Wilhite, uh, Mr. Sam Bell, uh, Dr. Karen Holbrook, uh, Ms. Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Barry Albert, uh, Dr. David Stamps, and Mr. Stryker. Uh, I also have to tell you that Russia invaded uh, Ukraine less than two weeks ago. And here today, in less than two weeks, we have prepared this program for you. A lot has gone for preparing this program. So I can't start unless I identify the individuals who played the critical role in making this program possible. First and foremost, I have to thank uh, Mr. Arman Mahmoudian. He is an exceptionally talented graduate student, PhD student, who is writing his doctoral dissertation. And he was kind enough, generous enough to work behind the scene and make this uh, program possible. Thank you, Arman, and good luck with your thesis. I also want to thank Mr. Uh, Christopher Feigley, who is the uh, in charge of streaming the program, Mr. Michael Abrams and Michelle Holden for marketing, and Dr. Rahere Dariyazadeh for her continued support. Uh, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is probably uh, one of the uh, most important events uh, in the past uh, uh, 50 years, at least since the beginning of uh, the end of World War II. And it has changed uh, the international, uh, it, it, it might change international order. Some people believe that it could lead to a new Cold War. And uh, whatever is the uh, result of this invasion, we do not know. But I am very uh, delighted that we have a guest tonight who is uh, an expert on uh, uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, he has asked me not to say, not to praise them much, but as you know, I have a tendency to praise people who deserve to be praised. So let me be very short about his background. And once I'm done with this, I will introduce him and we are going to start a program. The format of the program is the same as before. For the first 30 to 40 minutes, I am going to engage our guests uh, in a conversation about Ukraine and Russia. I will ask some questions and I will occasionally challenge his views. And once we are done with our conversation, uh, I am going to read the questions that are sent to me. Please, if you have any questions, send them to us. And uh, Arman is going to send those questions to me through email and I will read them and uh, Dr. Borowski is going to answer the question. Also, please understand that we depend uh, quite a bit on financial support of our viewers and, and our supporters. So if you're interested to support our mission, please go to the bottom of the screen and click where it says show more. And then the direction there is quite simple. If you cannot follow the direction, don't make any contribution because uh, it's quite simple. Uh, our guest today is Professor Robert Orlsky, who is a renowned expert on Russian politics, military affairs, and energy. Uh, he is a prolific writer and has written extensively about Russia and international relations and has been consulted uh, on Russian politics, and Russian relations with the people of Islamic heritage. 
During his 40 years of distinguished service at the University of South Florida, he served as the chief administrator officer of the Sarasota Bradenton campus. He has taught a variety of courses on international politics. And as a former chair of a department where he served, I, uh, I have seen just about all of his uh, student evaluation. And I have to tell you, he was, and he still is, a first-rate teacher and a first-rate communicator. He earned his undergraduate and graduate degrees from Brown and Harvard University, respectively. I consider Bob to be a dear friend, a wise analyst of current events, and, and a great asset to our university and to our community. Please join me to welcome Professor Robert B. Borowski. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, Bob, let me start very quickly uh, by asking you that President Putin of Russia claims that Ukrainians are actually Russians and therefore should be part of Russia. Is that true? Oh, my goodness, Mostin. Um, you got to know that I have Ukrainians and Russians in my family. So I've grown up with this from my childhood. There's a really simple answer. If you went down to, let's say, the Ukrainian church in, in uh, Northport and asked them what they are, they'll say they're Ukrainians. They won't say they're Russians. If you're in Ukraine, you ask people what you are, they'll say they're Ukrainians and they have their own language and their own land. So if you have your own language, your own land and your own ethnic identity, are you not a people who's to tell you you aren't? The thing is, all of Russian culture and civilization really began in Ukraine, in Kiev. And Kiev fell to the Mongols and was wrecked also through civil wars. That allowed Moscow to rise up and the Muscovites learned their governing ways from the Mongols and the Tatar Mongol yoke. And then they rebuilt, this, rebuilt a huge Eurasian empire and they came back and conquered you know, the original homeland of this great East Slavic people. The Ukrainians always saw them as the Moscovites. And they call them, their nickname for the, so the Russians who come and conquer you are Muscali, the Moscals. And, you know, the, so anyway, there is a Ukrainian people. But the Muscovite rulers always want to tell him you're just a branch of the family and your language is just a local dialect and, and, and you should just learn Russian and join the team. That's been the pattern for the last, I don't know, 500, 600 years. So that's an, that's an answer, a bit long, but there is a Ukrainian people and there is a, a Muscovite attitude towards them, which makes the Muscovite higher and the Ukrainian lower, and therefore the little brother has to listen to the older brother. Um, when, I, I, when I taught a course on comparative politics of Russia, the Soviet Union was one of the countries we covered in our class. And I remember reading that uh, uh, Putin uh, claims that uh, uh, Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin gave Ukrainians statehood as part of the Soviet Union. Well, how do Ukrainians feel about it? Well, they this? drew a border, right? And they put the name Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic on it, right? That is, yes. The Tsarist empire broke up. The, the, this empire broke up twice in the 20th century, if you think about it. World War I, right? The Tsarist empire broke up. Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland got their freedom. Everything else was reconquered from Moscow in a really bloody civil war, which killed at least 10 million people. So Ukrainians tried to rise up and establish independent statehood, but they, they couldn't do it. They were attacked by Poland from the West and the Red Armies from the East. And so Lenin promised statehood to the peoples and you would like join this union of, of socialist states. And you were supposed to have your own language, your own culture, your own communist party organization, 
within your republic. So that's the way it was promised. But then under Stalin, in particular, they waged war on all the Ukrainian intelligentsia, basically shot people, um, went back and forth on the language issue. But in the end, finally, it was, if you expect to go into the professions, have a decent job, you had better learn Russian. And so the Russian language became dominant again in the professions. But the worst thing is Stalin imposed draconian land collectivization laws on Ukraine, which led to this huge famine of some 5 million people or 6 million people. This is in the early 1930s. Think about that. That's only not that long before, you know, World War II and Hitler. All these people were killed. And those who resisted, a lot of them were just rounded up and shipped off to slave labor projects that Stalin had in his five-year plan, and also sent to Central Asia to dilute the Turkic Muslim population. So millions of Ukrainians died in Ukraine, and then others were just shipped off all over the former Soviet Union. Now, people know this. Every family remembers this the starving people, the situation that Stalin imposed. And let's put it this way. If, if Putin really wanted to have a good relationship with those people, he could have shown a little sympathy in his, historic, in his history. He left this completely out of his histories of Ukraine that he read on TV recently. Nothing about this stuff, nothing. It's, you know, we came down here, we liberated you, we gave you your culture, shut up. That's his attitude. So, Bob, if I understand you correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to me that Mr. Putin, the president of Russia, is the typical Muscovite yeah. uh, who is not going to let the Ukrainian people be free or go. This is by, well, re remember where his offices are. He's in the royal palaces, right, in the Kremlin. gigantic statue outside the Kremlin walls, you know, as if he's imagining, right, that he's the new Vladimir the Great, who who is going to re, rebuild things. And it's like, so we could call it like Russian imperialism revival. That's what he's up to now. He says it was always Russian. recently yeah in there at uh, least 13 14 percent of the population uh, bob today i was watching a uh, uh, congressional testimony of the head of the cia director of the cia and one of the things he said is that in private talks and sometimes in public declarations putin keeps insisting that there is no such a thing as the Ukrainian country or Ukraine as a country. So I Does guess he it, really believe this or I guess is this propaganda? I don't think he really believes it. I think what he believes is that he's rebuilding the Russian empire and that to rebuild it, you have to possess that territory. And the same for Belarus. And at a minimum, at a minimum, Northwest Kazakhstan, all the Russian nationalists believe this. I mean, the ethnic Russian nationals, including the late Solzhenitsyn, he preached the same thing, that the Russian state has to have this core with the Muscovite Russians, the Belarusians, the Ukrainian Russians, and Northwest Kazakhstan. Um, so that's, what, that's the way they think. So if, if the goal is to revive... Uh, the mighty Russian empire, yeah. and you're gonna start from Ukraine, uh, can we say that all Ukrainians are anti-Russian? Or are there pockets in Ukraine where uh, Putin's army and Putin himself can find allies? Well, he, you know, voting patterns and everything over the, la of the first 20 years of independence kind of divided between East and West, or east and southeast and west. And 
the language of preference follows the same pattern. So there was a tendency for the Western Ukrainians to be more anti-Russian. The, the Ukrainians living in the East and Southeast to be more sympathetic, you know, including a lot of the Crimea. And most of the people just sort of in between. I'll give you a good example, like the first minister of defense of Russia, I mean, of free Ukraine, had a Ukrainian mother and a Russian father, and they spoke both languages. You know, so you try to pull them all apart, it doesn't make sense. There are some at the edges, you know, who are really feeling super strongly about one language or another and identity, but most people were comfortable with the idea that you could be Ukrainian and speak Russian or be Russian and speak Ukrainian and all. And it's something hard for us to understand in our country because essentially, you know, we have one dominant language everywhere. So since Putin's invasion, I must say that more and more people are angry about the Muscovite and this guy in particular. Why did he do it to us? What's he doing? I mean, look at the huge size of this invasion. It's not, it's way more than putting down a riot in Berlin in 53 or putting down the Hungarian revolution or revolution in Poland or the Czech revolution, way bigger, right? Way, way, way bigger. And that means he intends to stay, although he says, I'm not going to occupy. He, he's really working on taking that whole Eastern zone. Permanently. Yeah. Bob, here is the, uh, for me, the most important question for me personally. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Putin came to power around 2000, yeah. the beginning of the 21st century. During the time that he has been the most powerful man in Russia, he saw what happened to the United States in Afghanistan. He saw what happened to the United States in Iraq. We thought that we're going to go to Iraq and be welcomed by the Iraqis. It didn't happen. It is very difficult, extremely difficult, extremely costly to invade another country and to be able to stay there and turn a military victory into a political victory. So the question I have for you is, what was going on in his head? What made him think you know, yeah. that his army is better than the U.S. army and that Ukraine with 40 million population, bigger than Iraq, more populous than Afghanistan, more advanced than both of these countries, would just capitulate? And the, then I ask who told him this was going to work, too, you know, in his advisory circle. When he had this big staged uh, meeting of the Security Council, the sanest, most experienced people were trying to say, slow down, let's negotiate more. And that included his foreign minister, Lavrov, who's the dean of all foreign ministers, very, very respected around the world. His minister of defense, who is of Tuvan, kind of Mongol Mongolian uh, ancestry. Um, the uh, His really tough guy named Kozak, who was responsible for, you know, hunting down and shooting the most radical leaders in Chechnya. He even was saying, well, we sh he was stuttering all over the place. And then he said, you know, we should say what we want and that we really mean it, you know, and do some more negotiation. Putin had them all sit down, impolitely so, you know, on national TV. And then he made them all come up at the end, well, the way Stalin used to do and make everybody say they support his program. And yeah, this was, this was really um, a display of the power of a dictator. Yeah. You know? um, and so he was a dictator. And he could make... And this. dictators always miscalculate. And what do we do about, you know, it, it, you can't have anarchy, so you need chains of command, right? You have a president, and he makes a decision. Does the army just disobey? I mean, when they were overthrowing communism, this was a problem at first uh, when Yeltsin wanted the army to come over to his side. But... The fact that Gorbachev was uh, kidnapped down on that island, and down in the Crimea, you know, allowed Yeltsin to say that I'm taking over as commander of chief and therefore, you know, I can order you to do things because your real president is locked up down there in the Crimea. And I've got copies of the leaflets he distributed to the soldiers.
Bob, to be to be uh, uh, to be fair to dictators, not all dictators are as reckless as Mr. Putin is. We have some democratic uh, small d leaders who have been reckless also. But I want to go to another key question. I have been reading a lot about Ukraine. I've tried to understand what is going on. I understand that what uh, Putin is saying about demilitarization of Ukraine. He's concerned about uh, Ukraine being uh, on the Western side, on the American side, and uh, uh, the Western powers could use Ukraine to invade Russia. I understand this. But he also talks about denazification. I've tried to figure out what does he mean by this? I honestly couldn't find anyone or any article that explains to me what it is Mr. Putin is talking about when he says denazification of Ukraine. Do you know what he's talking about? Well, yeah, especially when the um, the president and the minister of defense in Ukraine and the chief of staff of the president are all Jewish. <laughs> so how could that be a Nazi regime? I mean, this is nuts. What he's upset about is that there really are fanatical Ukrainian nationalists who have been around, oh, you know, from generation to generation, certainly since the late 19th century. But when the Nazis, when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, their propaganda people went around to in Ukraine and said, look, uh, we're here to liberate you from Jewish communism. And there'll be a future for Ukraine in this arrangement after the war when things settle down. And because the Germans did not have enough Germans to carry out, you know, their huge, huge imperial mission, they started creating different kinds of regional um, ethnic allies and putting them in uniforms to be policemen or what, whatever. But they would never really let the Ukrainians, who they put in uniform, um, to build a real army because Hitler. Hitler intended to enslave the area permanently, as you know. There was a big argument about this, even in Nazi circles. And um, so there were people who, sir, who worked with the Nazis towards the goal of wiping out the Soviet Union and somehow figuring out a way to liberate Ukraine. Those people their tradition stayed alive. I mean, there were, some of them were fighting into the 1950s in the woods in Ukraine. We brought their key leader into protection in West Germany. Stalin had him assassinated, I believe, in 54. And the, by the way, the person who received the assassin, who decided to defect because he, he knew that the, I mean, Stalin was dead, but this was Stalin's machine still, KGB operation. They were telling him he was going to come back to Moscow and be decorated. And he thought, I'm not going to come to Mos come home to be decorated. They're going to shut me up so that I don't talk. So he skipped over to our side. But we, we, we kept contact with a lot of the anti-Russian nationalists, even the, some of those who had collaborated with the Nazis because we were using them for anti-Soviet activities. So there is some such thing. I know about this very well, you know, personally knowing people in, in the area. And uh, yeah, so this is what Putin's complaining about. They march around, they have, you know, they have torchlight parades and all, but they're, they're a very small percentage of the population. And one of our experts in Washington here, a Russian who came over when he was younger, named Dmitry Symes. I mean, you may have seen him around. Yes, yes. Before they shut down my access, our access to one of these Russian talk show stations, Dmitry told them off on this on live Russian TV. He said, the biggest mistake you're making is with all this denazification nonsense. Nobody believes it. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Stop it because it's, it's just wrong and ridiculous. And he said, yeah. besides, you have neo-Nazis of your own in Russia, and they do. They have similar kinds of organizations who are extremely fanatical, great Russian nationalists. Putin is not letting them march around these days, but 
there was a time in the 1990s when they were marching around and having parades and the rest of it. And they got involved with this party called the, uh, oh, Zhirinovsky's party. I forget what some, they call themselves some kind of socialist party, but fascist. Yeah, they have them in Russia. So um, anyway, it's, it's absurd, but there's a little bit of truth to it. But he's looking for an excuse, you see, to purge the country. I want to go in there and purge them. So I'm going to purge them of Nazis. This is crazy. It's like Stalin coming in and, you know, arresting people, throwing them out of office and all, using an excuse of some, you know, something. All right, Bob, there are uh, right now uh, two schools of thought that I know of about uh, President Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. One is, and I think it is in the minority, based on everything I have seen, essentially says that uh, NATO expansion after the collapse of the Soviet Union has created fear and anxiety in Moscow. Their perception of threat has been elevated. And therefore, uh, Putin, by attacking, by invading Ukraine, is trying to put an end to it. In other words, they blame uh, NATO expansion for what Putin has done. On the other hand, there are people who say, no, this is an excuse. The real reason is because Putin wants to just annex the whole country. Where do you stand in this? Where do you oh, stand in the was, argument about you know, NATO expansion? Russian imperial revival, that's his ideology. So um, actually he's much stronger now vis-a-vis -vis NATO than he was, you know, 30 years ago. Think about it. I mean, Russia was in a collapse, a financial collapse after the breakup of the Soviet Union. And in a sense, NATO, you know, was keeping order in the region. And um, he didn't complain about it much then, did he? But he has told us, you know, recently, I want to sit down and negotiate a new security agreement. And we simply refused to do that. So there's some blame to go around here, but his desire to rebuild you know, this great Russian state is clear. And so, you know, he's an ally, an ally with China to help make this happen as well, right? I have uh, five more questions and we have already finished uh, 25 minutes of our program. So, and I wanna get to all my okay. questions, get to the audience. So please try to be a little bit uh, uh, faster in your answer. If uh, I want to now focus on the actual war in Ukraine, which uh, Putin has called, I love that, special military operation. You invade another country, you send 150,000 troops, you bomb the hell out of that country, you call it special military operation. I wonder what happens when he really starts a war. Uh, what is your assessment of the uh, situation in the 13th day of that uh, tragic invasion. Hey, by the way, we did things like that. We couldn't call the Korean War. It was a UN peacekeeping some arrangement or something, right? So whatever. Um, oh, the problem is nobody came running out with flowers and, you know, and cakes and everything, you know, and dancing people to greet these armies as they're showing up. Nowhere. And I'll tell you, Mosin, that during the last eight years, even in the little area he was claiming to protect, you know, the Donetsk and Lugansk, I never saw, you know, a bunch of happy people, even in the Russian news. They're like worn out, tired. They were wondering what's going to happen. He didn't get the he didn't get the nice response, did he? It's just no, he not, not there. It's like the, people aren't enthusiastic on either side, from my point of view. They like. Why the heck is this happening to us? Okay, so then that's it. He doesn't get the nice response, right? But he can use his rockets to blow up all the airfields and, and key things. But he doesn't blow up everything because you see the trains going every day from, you know, Lviv to Poland, you know, and stuff's still on. But he blows up basically the military infrastructure that we spent eight years building up. He blasted it all, right? That's demilitarization. So now the Ukrainian army... Has no, they're not going to go out in the open plains of Ukraine, you know, and say, here, you know, come out and fight like real men, because they'll be blasted. So they're digging into the cities. This is what's me missing from our news, right? 
they don't tell you how the Ukrainian armies have, are dug in and they're using city buildings and so on because that's, they don't have anything else. So they're doing that. And now Putin said, oh, we're not going to harm the civilians. He can't, he can't win his war without blowing up cities. So his war plan was ridiculous. You know, he thought he'd blow all this stuff up and people will come out with flowers and, you know, and cakes and stuff. And instead he blew everything all up and the Ukrainian army is sitting in the cities, you know, using heavy, the heaviest buildings in the most appropriate places as fortresses. So our news isn't talking much about that, but you ask yourself, where are the Ukrainian army? The people, they're not out in the plain, plains of Ukraine, you know, waiting to be shot up by a Russian helicopter. They are digging in and forcing terrible urban warfare on Putin. Right? This is exactly what but a hybrid thing, warfare is. It, it is not classical warfare. Mosul, I, you remember we blew, we, didn't somebody like blow the hell, hell out of some of those cities in Iraq to clear them out? Yeah. There was no other way to do it, right? Well, uh, Trump, you know, really jumped in with both fists to put an end to that. And Putin did the same thing in Grozny when he had to get the people who were using Grozny as fortresses. I was listening to one uh, of the prominent American generals talking about uh, Putin's war in Ukraine. And he was saying that if Putin is planning to occupy the entire country, he needs hell more than much, much more than 150,000 troops because he said, most likely we're going to see guerrilla type, guerrilla type warfare in urban cities, and it's going to be hell for Russia. Based on that, if that assumption is correct, which I believe to be very accurate, do you think Russia is planning to have a two-state solution to Ukraine, one being pro-Russia and the other one being pro-Russia? That's pro an option because if you can see where his armies are. And if you can go across Ukraine, you see the, the river Dnipro, the Dnieper River. The east side would be Russian. The west side could be Ukraine. That the Russian Russian analysts have put out, you know, various, various proposals. And this is one. Split it. You take the whole east and, and control the port city of Odessa, and then you've got a little rump state over there. Um, attached to NATO or whatever, and Putin will have at least done his egg aggrandizement enough to satisfy his imperial revival ambition. So, and to block Ukraine to access to uh, the sea, also, yeah. I mean, based on that two-state yeah. solution, it's going to be a landlocked country, and well, uh, they'd have to, you know, pay tribute to this Han, Han Putin, you know, to send their ships down to the Black Sea. He is now an old-fashioned Mongol Han in a way, right? You conquer everything, and and if they don't obey, you just crash and burn. And let me now uh, shift from uh, Ukraine to the international aspect of this crisis in Ukraine. One of the countries that uh, abstained in the UN uh, resolution to condemn Russian aggression. One of them was uh, China. Yeah. The other one was Iran. And I'm going to get uh, ask a couple of questions about each of those countries. Let me start with China. Um, what are China's national interests? Did China expect this war to be unfolding the way it has? Do you think they're going to stick with it? Or do they have a different plan? And eventually, they're going to deviate from the Russian path? Well, first of all, Western Europe is a much more important market, right, than Russia for the Chinese. And Russia is sort of, you could think of it as the railroad from China to Western Europe. They, the Chinese trains leave every day. The Chinese want that trade over land with Europe. And they also go around the Arctic. They'll be able to do that in the future too. So China, is is interested in stability in Eurasia, so they don't, so they can build these routes, right? 
They also want Russian natural resources to feed China. So, you know, the, the, and then the third interest is stability on their borders. If you look at this huge Eurasian landmass, you see if you put China together with the huge Soviet Union, tack on Iran, you've got a huge Eurasian landmass. And if they're all cooperating to some extent, there are great benefits for China. But the instability part, you know, the Chinese don't want that. And I would say maybe that the mess that Putin's created might have so give the China, made the Chinese think more carefully about plans to attack Taiwan sometime soon. That is just too damaging to society, economic interests, etc. Well, if, if, if China if China is contemplating uh, about doing this, they should look at what happened to Russia financially. Yeah. How the financial pressure on Russia yeah. is essentially destroying the economy of that In country. In the meantime, the Chinese will get better deals on oil and gas and coal and metal from Russia because Russia is getting desperate. The trade already jumped like 30% during the month between Russia and China. And further, China's got a, some kind of a pro, had a problem this year with wheat crop. You know, and Russia can export a lot of wheat to them too. So, I mean, China... China, China will take care of itself in this. And if it gets but, but, so bad, they might separate with Russia. But why would, you know, Russia needs to sell to them and they're going to take advantage of that. But Bob, if you, uh, if you uh, have to, uh, if, if you look at China's relationship with Russia before the invasion and look at it now, do you think the Russian invasion of Ukraine has increased the chances of cooperation between Russia and China in the coming decade? Or do you think it, it's going to decrease the chances? Or is that way too early to decide? Oh, I think, I think we would predict that China will be more independent. In other, in other words, moving away China, from Russia. Instead of playing the game, you know, that there are regional centers, it's going to be China and the United States. And they're not going to treat Russia as any, even pretend to treat Russia as any kind of equal partner. They'll, they'll be angry about, depending on how long this instability lasts, China, you know, they want stability. They do the long range planning. They do the big investment. And we look at Putin and they say, you're destroying, you know, decades and decades of investment, important economic investment between Germany, let's say, and Russia, and Europe and Russia. You're just you're shooting yourself in the foot by being so extreme. You should yeah. play the game very differently. Bob, am I correct that in saying that China is one of the top traders, uh, uh, business partners with Ukraine? No. Oh, no, it's not. Well, Ukraine is not an important factor in international trade. But yeah, the Chinese have been moving in. They have been moving in and they have been making deals, which that was very interesting, right, over the last couple of years. They were not respecting Russia's desire to have Ukraine as a Russian economic colony or something. The Chinese were coming in. I don't know what the numbers are, but they were interested in some very interesting projects. Because, for example, you know, Ukraine used to do, they've got people in Ukraine who are scientists from the Soviet days who did the missile, the rocket engine development, etc. Ukraine can build uh, ro rockets and dirty nuclear bombs in a big hurry if it wants to. But I also know that China is importing uh, agricultural products from Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, so there is that economic dimension. Now let's move the to the whole world uh, is going to suffer because of messing up of these wheat crops. We're going to pay more over here. It's already up fifty percent here. Wheat. Now let me move to uh, Iran. Uh, as you know, the nuclear negotiations uh, have been going on between uh, the six global power and Iran in Vienna, and Iran has refused to directly negotiate with the U.S. And much of this negotiation was done by Russia, which I believe was a huge strategic mistake Iran made. 
But that's the decision Tehran has made, and it's too late to talk about it. But one of the things that has happened in the past uh, 48 hours is that all of a sudden, Russia is now saying that they want some sort of guarantee from the United States that should there be a nuclear deal, the economic sanctions that the U.S. has imposed on Russia is not going to be applicable to Russia's economic relations with the Islamic Republic of Iran. They want some sort of guarantee, which, by the way, is exactly what the Iranians wanted from the U.S. But my question is, where was Russia a week ago? Why weren't they asking for this? And what do you think is behind, behind Russia's decision to perhaps delay the signing of a nuclear agreement or to throw stone in the way of a final agreement? What is Russia's calculation? There is one big, huge elephant in the room that the Russians don't want to make public. It's natural gas. 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 You go, you look at the reserves of um, Qatar and Iran and Turkmenistan just to the north. You know, you you know, Iran overlaps with Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan is on both sides, but those reserves are big enough to replace every bit of natural gas that Russia is sending to Europe. More than enough. And you could build pipeline. If the Middle East were stable, right, you've got various routes for pipelines through Turkey or even Syria to Turkey and under the Mediterranean. So if we wanted, if Europe gets serious about trying to replace natural gas from Russia, They've got to give a big piece of that to the Middle East, and the biggest source is right there in that Pars field, but also elsewhere up in Turkmenistan and other parts of Iran. Iran can be a powerhouse this way with a money flow. So Russia all, so happily kept Iran in the penalty box. They were delighted to leave the Ayatollah in because that meant that their market in Europe was safe. And now they're getting nervous, right? about this rapprochement. Same for nuclear stuff they sold around. It could all come from Germany. The revival of the Ottoman Empire, when you're talking to an Iranian, the Persian Empire has to be revived oh, yeah, too. Europe's if everybody too. is reviving their empire, we might as well do the same. You guys are getting <laughs> nervous because Turkey's been poking around, right? Yes, they're, they're saying, especially in Azerbaijan. All Turks <laughs> together, you know, we're going to have a mighty empire all the way from Xinjiang in China to Cyprus including all the Azeris in Iran. You're all going to join up. That's his dream. Uh, I have lots of questions in my cell phone that they're sending me. I wasn't checking uh, my email. And I'm checking the questions that Arman is sending to me. But I want to ask the last question, um, and then we'll uh, open our lines for questions. If you could impose a settlement, what would it be? Okay, so I worried about getting in trouble on this all day, and then I checked with a, the a important Ukrainian newspaper, and the paper had a head. The headline to, tonight and tomorrow is that Zelensky's party is talking about a new security arrangement, no NATO, a security arrangement guaranteed by Turkey, Russia, and the United States. And they're going to maybe be talking about this on Friday in Ankara. What does that mean? Oh, too. Referendums on other questions, yeah. like what part stays in Ukraine or and so on. So if I understand you correctly, the solution is uh, Ukraine would be neither toward the east nor toward the west. It would be neutral. Right. That's the only way they could ever be happy, because they keep getting ground down. They did after the first, you know, they did it for hundreds of years being ground between Russia, Poland, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Nazis, the Soviets, now NATO and Putin. Are you optimistic about that uh, option? <sighs> it's hard for, you know, isn't it really hard because we're so angry with Putin, we don't want to give him even half a victory. But we have to stop this killing. All right. So. Uh Bob, uh, we have been talking for almost 50 minutes, and uh, we need I more learned very much from your uh, 
insight and your wisdom. And uh, I want to thank you for uh, sharing your uh, observations. If you don't mind, uh, I'm going to read the questions that are sent to me. Some of them might be redundant, but uh, I'm going to read them anyhow. The first question is, will Ukraine leadership concede the Eastern territories in diplomatic negotiations? Putin seems like he will not accept anything other than total takeover and siege of the entire country. I guess you've answered that, but please go ahead and give a well, shorter that, version of it. According to this latest report from a good, solid anti-Russian newspaper right in Ukraine, they're looking for a for an end to the fighting and, and negotiations, including the use of referenda to fight to decide what to do, you know, with some of those eastern territories. Crimea is definitely I'll never allow that to go. And he'll want a land bridge there to Russia. But beyond that, you know, um, I think he might be willing to even allow some of that other territory to be part part of Ukraine, as long as you, this new Ukraine is bi bilingual. And neutral. Yeah. Neutral, bilingual, Russians That's can right. speak Russian, Ukrainians can speak Ukrainian. No more sneaky NATO stuff going on, or, you know, or turning you actually being in NATO, all of that would be out. Mr. Kevin uh, Vang is asking, slash you Ukraine and China, Taiwan, are often compared since the war started. What is your thought about the implications? Is that a fair comparison? Yeah, well, no. Well, let's just start with a United States official position is that Taiwan is part of China, correct? Ever since those Shanghai Accords, is the 50th anniversary of those Accords. China's make some noise about this. So it, it's all about rebuilding China, rebuilding the Russian Empire, yeah, except w what kind of methods will be used is the issue. China it does not give up the claim to Taiwan or that Taiwan will be unified with the motherland. It's, it does not. So under what circumstances and how they go about this, I don't think they'll want war. Unless, of course, I don't know. I mean, Xi Jinping, in his, some of his communist stuff I was reading, you know, it party a big deal about making sure that the military stays loyal to the civilians over and over, seen for a while. You could have hawks in China who could do something. You know, so it's I don't know. Tough. I think it's China. Well, We've said it's China, and then yeah. we keep arming them. Bob, I really think uh, the outcome, the outcome of Russian invasion is going to uh, 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 the, the order, the international order for decades. You know something? What you're just saying here is you know, a neutral Ukraine. What about a neutral Taiwan? That would be interesting. That would be an interesting thing. As a proposal from China. Because the Chinese don't want any NATO set up around them. This is something they made clear. That's why they favored an un, something to resist them in Europe. They, they do about that whenever they talk about Ukraine. Mr. Paul Sarno is asking, is this Russian attack hurting negotiations by the US to complete the JCPOA revival or the Iran nuclear deal? That's king about, you know, if it, sh it should be clear to everyone that if you're going to take a long range view and replace or reduce sharply Russian natural gas, you can replace it with Qatar Iranian natural gas. Folks over here, you know, think they'll just have LNG tankers, you know, going all the time over to Europe. There's some of that. But Putin also has new LNG massive plants up in the Arctic. But, you know, if you want to get rid of that dependence, you 
should go and look at Iran and say, look, you know, this is a great source. Yeah. You know, let's work towards this. You know, Bob, since 1979, when Iran was the leading, Iran has been losing its market, oil market, and uh, uh, really has not done, uh, has not been able to export its natural gas. And when you right. combine the natural gas with Iranian oil reserve, Iran is prime or number two source of energy in the world. And I think Putin's invasion has created the unique opportunity for Iran to uh, change the direction of its foreign policy and take advantage of the new opportunity for Iran to be able to lost markets in its oil and gas. Iran should you know, start talking about this openly, right, with Europe. And we know there's a rival across the Persian Gulf who really doesn't want to see Iranian oil industry really skyrocket. Absolutely. Or Absolutely. Iraq's, or Iraq's, because Iraq has a tremendous, tremendous reserves as well, for especially for yes. oil. So there's no shortage of oil, and, and, and even at $40 a barrel, there's no shortage mm -hmm. of oil. At 120, you could you could start squeezing it from rocks again, and you know in Montana. I mean, it gets ridiculous. At Iran that price. right now is uh, exporting about 700 thousand barrels of oil a day. Uh, maybe the actual number is higher or lower. I don't know, but it's about 700 thousand. But they yeah. can easily go up to 2.3 million barrel a day, which is what they had before President Trump imposed uh, unilateral sanctions on Iran. And that can help bring down the price. And that's why it is so important for Iran right now to take maximum advantage of this opportunity and begin to mm -hmm. negotiate with the U.S. directly now, not tomorrow, not five days from now, but now. But the Russians are putting a lot of pressure on Iran not to do that. I know. We want, Russia's got to keep them in the That's penalty right. box. That's right. Penalty box is the best description of this. Um, they get the yellow, yellow card, card every time they come. Or this one, if if Iran begins to negotiate directly, the Russians might give them the red card. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Or maybe with Turkey, they'll stir up the Kurds or something. The next question is, the next question is very interesting. And I don't know who sent it, but it's very interesting. How likely is it? that Mr. Putin will decide to move into a NATO country. And what do you predict the NATO alliance's response would be? Okay, this is really tricky because I noticed something he was chatting the other day with the Aeroflot stewardesses. This was the weirdest meeting I've ever seen. He took his long table. He filled it up with a whole bunch of beautiful stewardess from, this is from Aeroflot. And he sat cozily with them, not like, you know, miles away. And he's chatting away about everything. And somehow he commented on, um, you know, uh, you, he's kind of showing right now that he's making war against NATO and getting away with it. If you think about it, right? He is. And then if you look at the NATO agreements, you look at that wonderful Article 5 or whatever. It says an attack on one is attack on all. But then what comes next? Who decides whether to go to war or not? It's not automatic. Yeah. Um, so he would he would love to take Estonia because NATO right over next to St. Petersburg is really a bit too much for him. All right. I have two more questions uh, that I'm going to read and then uh, we will end our conversation. About, uh, Christopher Matos is asking, how do you think that the, uh, the protests in Russia will affect the outcome of this crisis or Putin's decision to con continue the war uh, on Ukraine? Well, there haven't been really big demonstrations compared to what we've had in the past. You know, there'd be 100,000 people out at sometimes in the past. They're not out there now. And I think as the weather gets warmer, It'll be a problem for him. The body bags come home. The people find out about the deaths better. He wants to get this thing ended. That's why I think he's looking for a way to end he wants this to thing. End it quickly, because yeah. 
all these sanctions from Hill, I mean, most companies suspended operations. They can't pack up and take every all the billions of dollars of machinery and everything and buildings and all they own in Russia and take them home. They can't. And, you know, every, there's a big interest in getting this ended and the easy way out for him if there is one. And, you know, we hate to give an easy way out because we don't want to give him a victory for this stuff. But we don't want people dying and dying in this complete disruption of a lot of the economy and globally. So we'll we'll be looking for it. They're they're talking behind the scenes now. Oh, you bet. They, you bet. Even, even little thing up there in Belarus, the Russians would give them a package of documents that go home. We're not hearing mm -hmm. about it. All we're hearing about is the uh, humanitarian corridors, right? But they're uh, talking in their league. I mean, Zelensky's already said he doesn't want to be in NATO anymore because NATO wasn't worth a damn. I think that's the best way of uh, uh, getting out and of the box. <laughs> Blame it on NATO. It was a sort of a warning to the other, the smaller, weaker countries right on the periphery yeah. of Russia. Uh, Bob, if I'm not, again, mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong about this. I read that somewhere between 60 to 65 percent, uh, according to the latest poll, of Russians support Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Is that surprising to you? Um, 60 to 65 percent. I'm not ready to to buy that yet because the telephone rings and you ask me if I support whatever I just hang I up. I know what you're going to say, Well, Now if you're in Russia, <laughs> of course I support the president. <laughs> Because they're listening, right? Of yeah. course, I support the president. And even beyond that, you know, he's revived the Communist Party through his Russia United. And young people who want to get jobs and all and get ahead easily, they join that thing. And, you know, they, if it gets really ugly at home, they might really come out and say they're against it. But right now, it's a little bit too soon. The more this drags on, you know, you'll get you'll get really, really serious disappointment that all these 30 years of building, right? Since the end of communism, everything from stupid things, well, not most, excuse me, um, a lot of little stuff like um, fast foods and all. Life's changed. In the old days, you'd have to get, you know, the stores were absurd. Now they're just like ours on Red Square. So it's lots guess, changed for better. They don't want to go back to that old days. Uh, I guess when uh, powerful countries invade weaker countries, they never ask themselves a simple question. How the hell am I going to get out? How am I going to get out? Well, because listen, getting well, in yeah. is the easy part of a war. He, he keeps saying he's not staying. Well, let's see. So you see, he'll just say, I told you I wasn't staying. He is like, probably. I, I got the. He, but, I got the neutralization. Well, if he achieves the goal that you described, that is dividing uh, Ukraine essentially into two parts, God knows. Uh, and maybe Zelensky knows that. And that's why he's trying to uh, uh, signal Putin that, look, forget about NATO. I, I learned my lesson. And let's just uh, put an end to this. Uh, Exactly. Well, he started that way when he ran his presidential campaign and that whatever forces pushed him, you know, down this NATO and arming path. And by the way, where are the Ukrainian oligarchs? We're always punishing the Russian oligarchs. This pro Zelensky newspaper sent, you know, like a question to something like 25 of them. And then only a handful came out and condemned you know, Putin's invasion openly. A lot of them are just still sitting, you know, waiting because they value their assets. Well, well uh, the question I have is... Oh, it's oligarchs. Uh, we knew about these oligarchs for years uh, and we left them alone. And suddenly, now that uh, Russia has invaded, <laughs> we're going Since after the yachts. And... They were throwing money around Washington like crazy, you know, hiring lobbying firms. Yeah. Well... Yeah. Uh, Bob, uh, we have come to the end of our uh, conversation. Uh, this was a fantastic uh, 
conversation you and I have had. And uh, uh, hopefully we can have uh, uh, repetition of that soon when the uh, when the crisis in Ukraine ends and when uh, the pain and suffering of the heroic Please. people of Ukraine has come and, to an end. And to all of this ridiculous bloodletting yes. and this, yes. Putin's going to go down in history with this in a negative way, no matter what happens, because people are not going to be happy about this. As, as we used to say in Berkeley in the late 60s and early 70s, war is not the path. Give Love peace it. a chance. So, yeah. Thank you very much for your time and for your insight and your wisdom. And I look forward to seeing you soon so that we can continue this conversation one to one and hopefully to bring you back to our center. Thank you so much, Bob. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us for another program. If you are interested in uh, knowing about our future events, please use the uh, send your email address to Arman and we will include it in our list. With this, have a wonderful evening and good night.